What I'm going to look at now is how to tighten the front axle on this bike. Now, before I looked at this, I wasn't entirely clear on how this works, but um, after a word with Brooke, it all became very clear. I had a look around the internet, I couldn't find the information I needed to know, and he gave me exactly what I needed to know. Um, because I'd sort of, whilst putting this together previously, I'd sort of noticed that this, you know, unlike the rear axle, the front is not, the fork is not squeezed onto the axle by two bolts. You know, obviously one can see that there's no bolt on this side. There's uh, this pinch bolt here, which squeezes the fork on this side, and then there's a bolt on the other side. And I was a little confused by that, but it makes perfect sense. So what happens is the rear axle is fine if it uh, squeezes together onto the, onto the wheel and the bearings and the spacers and everything. It's, a, it's allowed to squeeze on that. You know, the, it fits pretty, it's a tight fit, it's an accurate fit. But from there on, you know, once it's all assembled, you can tighten up the bolts on both sides and let it squeeze on that. And that's because the um, swing arm is a single piece of metal that goes up and down like that. And it doesn't actually matter what happens here. If, this is, if, there's, a, if there's a little bit of sideways tension on the arms one way or the other, it doesn't matter. So long as it's tight, it goes up and down. It's fine. With the forks, each of these um, legs, these stanchions, needs to be able to slide up and down the leg as smoothly as possible, and it cannot have any kind of sideways motion applied to it. There can't be any distortion, stretching, you know, pulling or squeezing of these. They have to just move up and down as if there was no wheel attached. So if I took the wheel off and just had that leg sitting there, that's how it needs to be able to move up and down. If I took both of those forks and squeeze them together, like put force on them to move them together, and then try to move up and down, there'd be some binding. You know, the fork would not be able to move up and down freely. And so what they're trying to do with the fork, in fact, is only one side gets the bolt, and only one side gets the axle with the bolt on it, and that, you do that up tightly, so that you've got this L shape. So this leg here has the axle fastened to it very tightly with the bolt, and this side doesn't. And when you've got this all torqued up, all the bits together and it's all torqued, this side here ideally would have a slight gap between the leg and the washer, the next item on the, uh, on the axle. If it's touching up tight, you might need to be suspicious that something's wrong. Um, see, if I look in there now, this is undone. I can see a gap about that wide, about a millimeter or so. And if I move this, I can actually take this leg and move it out slightly and squish it in slightly. So whilst it's not pinched up, it's in a position where it can freely move up and down. And the idea is you want to tighten it at that point where both legs are relaxed, where they're not squeezed together, not pushed apart. That's where you tighten up the pinch bolt, and that's how it needs to um, be done. So I'm not just going to tighten it like that. What I'm actually going to do is take the bike off the um, stand and off that piece of wood that I've had it sitting on and I'm going to bounce the forks up and down a bit with this loose, with the pinch bolt loose, just to seat them a bit better. Same as you'd do if you were trying to align the forks as well, just try and bounce them up and down a bit. And then on the final bounce, I'll just let them come up and then I'll tweak the bolt on and then I'll get it on a stand and actually um, torque it up. And I need to torque up this uh, wheel nut on this side, so let's do that first. I'm just going to use this thing on this side, because that's the only thing that fits. That 
50. There we go. 50 it is. So the next step with that loose, I can see a gap between the leg and the washer that's up against the speedo drive. Oh yeah, when you do up that bolt, make sure your speedo drive is coming out at the correct angle, the most uh, suitable angle, because it can come out in any direction, but once you lock that up tight, it's fixed. Okay, so with that done, now I'm going to bounce the forks so that this leg, this leg here, which I can move outwards and I can push inwards, that, I just want it to relax and just sit in one position. So that's what I'm going to do. Good. So now we're left with a gap that I can see. And in this case, it's about as wide as that, just, just slightly less than that. That's how big it is. All right, moving right along. Um, that's all I need to do there. Okay, that's all there is to it. Bye bye. up here testing my suspension because I have a fitted Racetech fork um, emulator cartridge and uh, I wasn't sure I'd notice the difference before I did the work a few months ago I sort of uh, took some rides on bumpy roads and these regular roads I'm on and I tried to get the feel exactly of what the forks felt like so that maybe I could compare. And uh, I think it actually worked out. I was able to, when I took the bike on its first ride yesterday, at first I didn't notice anything, but then quite quickly I did. 
once I thought about it. So what I wanted to do was talk about the forks. Now, I will probably have posted this as part of a video, maybe a single video, maybe a couple. Uh, this is after the second ride, a very short ride. And uh, obviously I was very keen to find out or see if there was any noticeable difference. Now, I didn't know what to expect sort of i know what the kit does the cartridge emulator thing um what it does is it provides a more progressive or more granular amount of damping so that the fork theoretically can deal with gets very light damping for small movements but as the movement gets bigger the damping gets harder so it's progressive and it does it in uh, using a little gadget that has holes in it and a spring that you can adjust. Um, and just the way it works uh, either lets a little bit of fork oil through or a bit more or a lot more and then all of it, sort of like that. Um, I've got 300 cc's of 10 weight Bell Ray, some nice, nice oil fork oil in it. I think it's 10. I think the default is 15, but the recommendation was, you know, if you're, if you're getting that lighter functionality, um, using a slightly lighter oil gives, gives you that benefit. Um, but exactly, exactly how you set it up and what oil you use and so on depends on how you're going to ride the bike. Uh, Brooke said he was out at Barber with a professional rider and a team of engineers and they they tuned, well they tried all variations of the kit. They were getting these set up for the uh, the Halewood, the replica of the Halewood replica called the Halewood. And uh, this is actually one of those. This set is one of those sets that he uh, gave me very kindly, very, very kindly. And so I've set it all up, put it in. Um, the goofy parts were the preload, how much force, you know, how much should you push the uh, springs in the top here. And if I posted this as part of a video that uh, will have been shown how I did that and what I did. I didn't know how much to give it. Um, in the end, I gave it sort of as much as I could sort of easily handle without risking the threads of the um, fork caps there. And on first test of just getting the bike, getting the wheels back on and everything, getting the bike on the ground, it seemed too hard. Just seemed too hard, like it was all the way maxed out here, like I was getting no sag at all. And so I took off 20 mil of my 35 mil that I calculated that I'd added and uh, seemed about just by feel it seemed about right and so I put all put that all back together and along that road yesterday I felt like the fork wasn't working it seemed stiff like it was like I couldn't feel any movement I kept looking over down at the fork to see if it was moving or not and it just felt like there wasn't movement happening. When I'd stop and use the brake on it, you know, I could see fairly normal movement, it seemed. Uh, but while riding, it didn't seem to have movement. I couldn't really feel it. And um, after halfway through the ride, I realized that, oh, <laughs> it's working. What it was doing was dealing with the finer bumps without transmitting them through to me. That's what it was doing. I wasn't feeling the road, you know, the, the, every little pebble on the road wasn't coming through the forks and I, I wasn't feeling it. 
So it actually felt good and I realized, oh, it's actually working. That's what it's doing. It's just working much, much better for the fine stuff. And so I rode around, looked at bumps, tried to observe it. And yes, it's definitely uh, much finer on the uh, fine bumps, much smoother, just sort of you don't feel them. And it makes it feel like it's not doing anything, but it is doing something. It's doing more than the old forks. The old forks were, you know, they were juddery, rattly. <laughs> um, I've never ridden one of these with the original rear shocks, but I understand they were like that as well. And so I would take that as a success, as far as this is concerned, just for how I've used it. I set it up using the, the yellow spring, just wound on exactly how it was by default. Um, as I was explaining, Brooke had a team out at Barber and they were testing this, testing all variations of preload and the different springs and all that. And they said their rider couldn't really determine much difference between them. And, you know, it was a bit of a muchness. And so he found that the default spring, the yellow one set up as it is by default, that's fine, unless you're racing or something, which I'm not, but you know, just for your everyday use, that's fine. That's a good setup. So, well, so far, I guess I can agree with that. Chances are, if I put a different spring in, probably wouldn't notice it. Um, but clearly the, the system works. So very happy with that at this point. Um, 